I feel as if, I feel as if I'm losing all my leaves, one after another. The branches and the wind. I don't understand what's happening anymore. Do you understand what's happening? All the business about the flat? You don't know where you can put your head down anymore. I know where my watch is, on my wrist. That I do know. For the journey. If not, I wouldn't know when I might have to... Hello, 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 and welcome back to the Lit to Lens podcast, a safe place for folks who like the movie better than the book and vice versa. We are recording this on Sunday, April 11th, 2021. Today, we are discussing The Father. With uh, me to talk about the adaptation is the watch-stealing, face-slapping, and often forgetful Mr. Eric. Say hello to the people, E. Hello, people. I am. Uh, neither one of us is a father, so this was sort of a, a difficult movie to understand you know parenthood and, and all all of its troubles at least that we know of yeah so but um yeah i, I don't think i've ever stole a watch or or slapped anyone in the face have you ever been accused of stealing a watch no have you ever been accused of slapping somebody in the face probably well they would i feel like they would know right if it came from me just a big yeah big old pop i used to tell our friend scott back in high school um you know we both scott is a little uh he likes to talk he's a little scrappy yeah and he would he would always tell me like eric i could beat you in a fight and i told i would tell scott if we got into a fight it would take four seconds and the first three seconds would be the countdown <laughs> <laughs> you should bring that back i haven't heard that one in a while yeah that's a, good a great one. little uh little shit talking tidbit. so anyway that's <laughs> shout out scott yeah that's the only time i would ever consider slapping somebody but that was a long time ago yeah that was different me you might slap scott but me yeah i mean because you know. he's he you know is annoying at times, <laughs> so he can be there you go himself um i don't know if you noticed but i wore my watch today oh Eric, so i don't usually don't wear it but i figured today would be a good day to wear it just in case you know you think about stealing it or anything like that or misplacing it it's on my wrist it's I important know, to know what time it is at I all times time. i always have two times one on my watch and one on my mind the one on your wrist and one in your mind what did i say the one on your watch I guess that's right. It's on my wrist too, I guess. Anyway. Either way, we're going to keep moving. Um, so we'll give you guys some fast facts. Uh, the play, which is called Le Père, is that correct? Yeah. Pronunciation? Wow. Okay. Did you take five semesters of French in college? Yeah, I, I mean, I did. It's been a long time. So so Le Père, uh, written by Florian Zeller, premiered in 2012 at the Theater uh, Théâtre Héberto in Paris, France. So That was good. Take that one with you. It has won several major theater awards, including the Molière Award for Best Play, the Molière Award for Best Actor uh, for Robert Hirsch, and the Molière Award for Best Actress, Isabel Galinas, or Galina, I'm not really sure, uh, and the Tony Award for Best Actor in 2016 for Frank Langella. So, um, very widely uh, and critically acclaimed. So, Goodreads rating 4.35 of 124 ratings. The movie premiered at the Sundance Film Festival in January 2020, directed by Florian Zeller, who also directed the play. This was his film feature directorial debut. Screenplay was also by Florian Zeller and Christopher Hampton, who is also known for writing screenplays for the the films Dangerous Liaisons and Atonement, uh, starring Anthony Hopkins, Olivia Coleman, and Mogan Poots, Rufus Sewell, or Sewell, not really sure, Olivia Williams, Mark Gaddis, Rotten Tomatoes, 98%, Metacritic, 88%, Received six Academy Award nominations, including Best Picture, Best Actor for Anthony Hopkins, Best Supporting Actress for Olivia Coleman, Best Adapted Screenplay, Production Design, and Film Editing. So, Eric, do you have any thoughts on what I just said? Yeah, well, a lot of thoughts. Um, this movie was pretty pretty great. 98%, pretty high. I think worth it. Metacritic yeah. 88 also is high for Metacritic, right? Usually Metacritics are below Rotten Tomatoes. Mm-hmm. Good, good-ass movie. Yeah. And we did it. This got an adapted screenplay nomination. Thank God. So for our pre-work, trying to identify the films most likely to get these award nominations, we were, what, four for five? We were like pretty damn close. We were close. Uh, the 
Borat one kind of fucked us up, but yeah. But also, as we uh, learned, News of the World not the best movie, probably nah. not deserving <laughs> of a uh, Oscar nomination. No, no. So actually, we only got three of the five. Uh, the awards are Bor- Borat, The Father, Nomadland, One Night in Miami, and The White Tiger. So The White oh. Tiger was another one that we didn't do. Yes, but streaming on Netflix. Yeah, I heard it's good. So um, we'll see. Okay, Give us a quick uh, recap. Yes. Uh, The father, a man refuses all assistance from his daughter as he ages. As he tries to make sense of his changing circumstances, he begins to doubt his loved ones, his own mind, and even the fabric of his reality. That is true. Le père. Le père. So, quick game. Two truths, one lie. Eric, are you ready? Do you know how to play? Yep. Three statements. Two of them will be uh, truths. I had to make sure that was the right one. Two truths, one lie. Or um, reality has shifted in a way that all of these might be somewhat true just the order of uh reality has been warped i like that so it's a little tidbit for later so number one this is le Père's second film adaptation number two anthony hopkins was florian zeller's second choice for the lead role in the film and then anthony hopkins has six academy award nominations eric do you know the answer well so this play was written you said in 2014 around there so I mean, certainly there could be another adaptation before this, and maybe it's French, but that doesn't seem... There's not a lot of time in there. So I'm going to say that one is... Uh, mm, let me. I'm going to go down the list. So Anthony Hopkins, second choice for the role. It w- could make sense that he wanted like Frank Langella you know, from Broadway to Tinseltown. That's possible. And then Hopkins also with six Academy Award nominations. I would imagine all for his role of Odin in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Incorrect. So no. that's also possible. I don't think he's played Odin enough to, to receive six nominations, but, oh man, these are, this is actually hard. Um, I'm going to say that Anthony Hopkins was, I'm going to say that this is, this is not La, Le Père's second adaptation. Is that your final That's my final answer. You are the weakest link. Goodbye. That's Incorrect. Th- okay. So you were going to say the right answer at first. Anthony Hopkins was Florian Zeller's first choice. And he actually only wrote it for Anthony Hopkins. And he said it would not have been a, would not have been made if he didn't accept it. Wow. Yeah. So he's like, fuck the actors who played this on Broadway. Yeah. Not good enough. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, bro. Anthony Hopkins doesn't slum it on Broadway anymore. Of course not. Why would he? Interesting. Yeah. So I guess the character in the movie is named Anthony. Anthony yeah so so he wrote, actually wrote the script with that in in mind yeah it's sort of like the nomad land thing which i don't think we talked about on air but i realized when i read the screenplay which is that the character that francis mcdormand plays in nomad land is named francis yeah so a little uh Fern. bringing reality to the screen yeah absolutely there you go and then the uh the first film adaptation uh, of le pair was called floride which is a french film based on the play uh, which was released in 2015. Um, and then the last one, he does have six Academy Award nominations, including this this most recent one. So he hasn't won since Hannibal Lecter in whatever the early 90s. Is that so his only win? That's his only win. Yeah. Six is a lot of nominations. It is a lot. Um, I, th- I imagine that ranks pretty high all time. Yeah, I imagine there's only maybe a handful or maybe certainly less than a dozen people with that many noms. But yeah, so... All right. You you lost. Congratulations. I think that's the only one I've ever lost. We're going to go to a quick break, get some life advice from me. My life advice for this week, or for this episode, is to watch your step while you're walking on sidewalks, because if you step on wet leaves, you will slip, and you will likely eat it, unless you're athletic like me, which I saved myself, obviously, because, you know, I have uh, quick reflex muscles. So. You also have brand new... Do you have one brand new ACL, or, do you have, or are they both new? Um... They're both relatively new. They're both about one is about ten years old. The other is about a year and a half. There you go. So he's he's a baby, but he's you know a spring chicken. Yeah, you've got these springy, uh, very young, athletic, you know, workable ACLs. What that, can I say? I mean, I'm I'm an improved version of myself. That's my recommendation: is to get new ACLs every ten years. <laughs> it's like a it's like your car warranty. <laughs> you should replace these. <laughs> and we are back. Uh, thank you for that brief word from me. So. Just uh, be wary out there, folks. When you're walking on sidewalks, just be careful. Yeah. Wear uh, good shoes. I think good shoes is another and good lesson. Good shoes for sure. And I was wearing my van, so that's how it is. But 
also get your ACLs checked out. Replace those every 10 years, like <laughs> Eric said. Okay, and now we're going to talk a little bit about the play. Eric, what'd you think? Did you like reading it? I did like reading it. Um, I think you could really see while reading it that there is or was in this play um, the bones of something really, really great. Uh, it's a story about dementia, about losing one sense of reality. And the play explores that by literally shifting everything all the time. Um, ostensibly, the actions of the play occur in a single room in a Parisian flat, but the items in the flat shift, right? Some things get lost. I think I think the stage directions like say the flat gets progressively uh, like emptier and emptier mm -hmm. as the play goes on. And then on the people side, um, some of the main actors and actresses are played by different people mm -hmm. at different points in the story. Um, so it's, there's just a constant shifting of what may be real and what may not be real right? to the point where you don't always fully understand either where you are in the story or who is supposed to be who. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but for me, it's like that was easily understood on the page because you could see like, okay, this character is Anne and then this character is woman. Mm -hmm. It's like the, the name of the person in the right. play. Right. Um, so while I think that was good and I if you think you could like tell it was clever, mm -hmm. it doesn't quite have the same oomph as when you saw it visually. Right. I think. So the bones were all there, but I, you could tell like, man, this would be really cool on the stage or yeah. on the screen. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, seeing it live must have been kind of an incredible experience because I think, especially with plays, like people don't have too much knowledge beforehand. With movies, it's a little bit different. Nowadays, you, you have so much access to, you know, people's reviews and, you know, people, whatever. You have information about the movie. But plays, it's a little bit less of that. So I think going into this without any knowledge of, you know, how it was going to be constructed, just it's, a you know, a play about dementia. I bet it was startling to see it live, um, to see different actors play the same character essentially and be thrown into that uh, alzheimer's world from the perspective of the main character yeah totally agree um and I, I actually read the play after watching the movie i decided to do that without actually knowing too much about it but i'm really glad i did why um just i mean the the visual uncertainty like really hit me harder than i think the play would have yeah you did it down i'm typically we read before we watch right I don't know. I had no foreknowledge to to change it up this time, other than I just like felt like it. Mm -hmm. But it was kind of like worked out for me. Interesting. Yeah. Maybe we should like do that more in the future. See if it helps or not. I, I think for this, it certainly helps more because you have that sort of like what when that first scene came, right? Where it's a different actress who plays Anne. Yeah. Is that like with the moment you're like, oh shit. Yeah. Yeah. I was like, who's who is that? Who is Anne? Right. Um. But then that character, or that actress comes up again and again and again mm -hmm. in the play. And, and then you sort of get a sense of who she is. But at the very first, that is like the very first moment when you're just like, oh, shit. Yeah. This is a different person. Yep. Um, and we were watching with my wife last night and she like comes down and she's like, oh, who's that? I'm like, uh, that is Anne. But also maybe not Anne. I right. guess we're not really sure who that is yet. Yeah. Why did you leave? Now we have to explain something that we actually don't, we don't quite know. Right. Yeah. And so reading the play, you certainly, like you said, get a sense of what's happening in that respect um, with the fact that uh, the character's name is woman, changed to woman, and then back to Anne. And then for the same for her husband, right? Paul, I think. Yeah. Changed from Paul to man. man. So you get a sense of like, there's something kind of funny going on here, but you don't really know and you don't really get the same feeling as seeing it visually. So um, definitely enjoyed reading it. Quick read. It's only like seventy-eight theater yeah. theater page or whatever uh, pages. Um, so it's a quick read. It's it's breezy. Um, so yeah, I like it was a, yeah it was definitely a really propulsive read. It's all dialogue. There's yeah. like no there's a there's a couple of moments of like it's not quite like scenery setting, but to say like you know we're in Act Ten, but this is actually going to be the continuation of Act Five. Right. So it'll it'll set you up a little bit, but not a ton. Right. Mostly it's just dialogue. Yeah, no. So definitely recommend reading it. It's quick. Um, and I have a cool little hipster uh, paperback yeah. to show the people, you know. And put it on the IG. Yeah, got to. So, Eric, what were some parts of the play that you were excited to see adapted? Well, like I said, I, I, I flipped these. But to me, 
the only thing that really mattered between the adaptation um, of the play and, and, the, and the movie is, does the structure, can it work? Um, because the story is told non-chronologically. Mm-hmm. And I think you get a sense of that pretty early on. Um, there are scenes that happen earlier in the day, scenes that happen later in the day, scenes that happen in the middle of the day. And they're sort of like all just thrown together purposefully, obviously, but like in, in a different order. Mm-hmm. Um, and because the main character has dementia, you also don't know what is like true or not true at the moment that you're seeing it. So because it's told like that, if it, if it becomes too confusing, if it becomes too hard to follow, then the movie just doesn't work. Right. So it was obviously a choice to tell this story in, you know, fragmented fragments. Mm-hmm. But if if it didn't work, then it, the movie just couldn't work. Right. I mean, I think this movie sort of throws people in with, um, you know, the moments of emotion where you don't know who is who. And so it forces you to sort of focus, right, a little bit more, um, which certainly helps in this regard. Because if you're passively watching this movie... I just don't think that you're really going to be interested. This is not a second screen movie. No. Yeah. Uh, and I do think it's a movie that you may have to watch a couple of times to really fully understand it and really understand the structure of it, like you said. Um, and that is probably a very difficult thing to to bring to the screen, right? Like yeah. You, like you said. Um, so were there any other parts that you were excited to see adapted? Uh, no, I think that the acting is the other big thing, right? Just because it is so it's such a big ask of your main actor to play Alzheimer's, right? Like to, to play somebody who has to know that they don't know what's going on. Yeah. I just think there's like a a lot of levels in that, which makes it difficult. Yeah. I imagine he probably did a lot of research, um, you know, just watching people with Alzheimer's and that was probably pretty difficult. I would imagine. Right. I think that's, I mean, it's difficult to watch a film, based on it but to see it in reality is probably even uh more emotional emotional and significant yeah plus the 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 play is pretty technical too like there are scenes where it stops on a word and then five scenes later it picks up on that word Mm -hmm. and just plays out the the rest of that scene yeah so as far as like organization goes they kept it pretty organized Mm -hmm. like they knew why they were stopping where they were stopping and how it was going to pick up later. Right. And I think that was kind of cool to, to see. You're yeah. like, oh, uh, I remember this line of dialogue from before. And now we're just seeing the rest of that scene play out. So yeah. it's like, if you were confused of what's happening, you sort of have this sentence or two sentences to like jog your memory and be like, okay, we're actually picking up here. Right. From before. It's sort of like in Cloud Atlas, like the first chapter that just abruptly ends. And then you have 500 pages and then it picks up again. Yeah, but at least that you have titles. Yeah. So here, sort of like, you know, I guess the stage would go black or sometimes they have, we had like fade outs and fade back ins in the movie. Mm-hmm. But they're, the only way you would know that is with like some sort of couched thing that you remember from before. Right. Like, uh, was the, when, oh man, are you just going to like stay here and get on everyone's tits or like yeah. whatever that line of yeah. was that they repeat a couple of times? And that line was like, oh, is that a Britishism? I've never heard, like, you're getting on my tits. I think so. And I don't know, that stuck out to me. And then it happened again. And I was like, okay, so we're actually, we're in the same scene. We're just out of, we're just like way out of order. Right, right. But I think that organization helped lessen the confusion for the viewer. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Um, And then why do we think this was adapted? Well, I think there are, there have been Alzheimer films. Um, I know that Julianne Moore was in that movie Still Alice a couple of years ago. Mm, yeah. I don't know if she won the Oscar or she was nominated for the Oscar. That's really the only one I can think of. But I, I think the idea of Alzheimer's is really compelling from a author, writer, actor's perspective. It, it, it contains so much in like that single disease. There's There's death, there's you know, history, there's memory, there's family, because, you know, when you lose your ability to like remember things or live in the reality that everyone else is living in, it can put a strain on the people that are caring for you. Right. Um, but it's having said all that, it's how do you make a, a film or a story about someone that is confused without it being confusing? Right. I think it's one of the hardest subjects to, to render just because, as a main character, that person is so unreliable yep. because nothing is real right. to them, right? Or their reality is 
very, very warped and very... Everything is confusing yeah. to them. Yeah. So I, I think the way this works is that you have a really good take on what Alzheimer's is like for somebody. Mm -hmm. And because there's not a lot of good takes. Right. I haven't seen Still Alice, so I, I can't speak to that. But I know that's the other big Alzheimer movie. Mm -hmm. um, I think because it is a really good take, that makes it's like a really compelling thing to make. Yeah. I mean, given the nature of the success of the play and how popular it was and, and how critically acclaimed it was, I think that certainly helps, right? You have, you already have a structure, right? In mind, you already have uh, a screenplay sort of script written out um, based on the story. The, and it's a visual medium, right? A play is a visual medium. All you need to do is figure out where to put the camera, right? And among other things. So you have kind of a base to work from, right? And then obviously the subject matter, I think is, is you know, it, it touches everybody especially today. It's a very timely subject, right? And like you said, it hasn't really been adapted uh, or, or that subject matter hasn't really been told that significantly before. Like you said, Still Alice. I mean, honestly, I didn't even remember that movie until you mentioned it. But certainly a subject matter that is instantly emotional, um, instantly relatable to a lot of people um, and told from a way that's like pretty amazing. I mean, putting the audience in the shoes of somebody who has dementia is like you said, a quite a heavy task. Yeah. Um, and to tell it in a, in a structure that makes sense to the viewer is, you know, something that should be celebrated, honestly, because, you know, having an un unreliable narrator and somebody who's confused throughout the entire story um, and telling it from their perspective to make it make sense to a viewer is, you know, quite an accomplishment. Yeah. The only other movie I can think of that deals with memory loss would be Memento, mm, the yeah. Christopher Nolan joint. But even that movie is is more of an action adventure movie where he is trying to solve a mystery, mm -hmm. and his I guess he has like short term memory loss is sort of his like character flaw. Mm -hmm. It's not an all consuming part of his character like right. it is for Anthony Hopkins in the movie. Like he can't do anything without having issues with memory. But yeah, in Memento he he can do other things, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um. So yeah, so that's why we think it was adapted. I mean, clearly we're going to get into the the movie a little bit, but a little bit later. But is there anything else you want to say about the play before we move on? No, I think it was really, I th I, I really enjoyed reading it. Um, it's very similar to the movie, mm -hmm. which is maybe a a segue to the, our next section. Yeah, but I would, I don't know, if people want to pick it up, I, I would recommend it. Yeah, I mean, it's really not that difficult of a read. I mean, it's sure it's a bit confusing at first, and but you kind of pick it up as it goes on, and it's short. I mean. It, it's a play it's all dialogue it's not a heavy lift from you uh from your brain so maybe read it in french if you're trying to learn french there yeah. you go are you trying to learn french le, le pair i'm on a 300 day streak on duolingo so i pretty much already know french oh my god that is pretty good yeah congratulations thank you so, so it's been, almost i've been doing it all quarantine basically okay so you got like, almost a couple, couple more months before you hit 365 yeah do you get like a, a badge or like a prize for something i don't know i i had a coworker once who was doing duolingo gaelic i think it was oh my god and she had like a 600 day streak jesus i was like that's a little much yeah that's for gaelic yeah i mean that would certainly be an interesting language to learn but i don't think duolingo is the way to learn gaelic probably not i don't i mean i think gaelic is dead right i don't know no they definitely still speak it in, in ireland but mostly english mostly english thank god so unlike paris maybe i need to do duolingo for english and clean up some of like my my <laughs> ticks and flaws i think you should that'd be that'd be interesting we're gonna go to a quick break we'll be right back if you like what you're hearing please rate and review us on apple Podcasts. it'll help us find more fine listeners like you and we're back thank you for that brief word from eric now people know where to find us and how to rate us please rate us review like us and tell a friend you think people would figure out how to rate and review a podcast, but they don't. It's hard. You have to tell them. Yeah. So um, we actually actually are going to bypass the joke version uh, this week or this episode because we just didn't really feel right making fun of a character who is suffering from Alzheimer's. Um, and also because we couldn't really come up with good jokes. But yeah, both of those things were true. Exactly. So we can make fun of little children in the news of the world episode, but that's where we draw the line. Thank you. And you got to draw it somewhere. You got to have standards. Yeah. So we're going to move right past that. And we're going to talk about the film, the father, Eric, did we like it? 
Uh, very much so. I, I thought this movie was was affecting. Um, it was very emotionally like wrenching. Um, but like we mentioned in the play version, it was just improved by having actors, by having like the visual element of the flat changing um, and by having the actors change. Yep. So I, I think like liking the play, I mean, I watched the movie first, but liking the play and then adding on that layer of confusion brought forth by your ability to play with the sets and play with the people I think just worked like uh, like amazingly well. Yeah, I mean, I love this movie um, for all the reasons that you mentioned. Um, it was really, really interesting to watch a film from a narrator who didn't know what the hell was going on. Um, and it sort of put me in a different perspective, obviously, and it sort of put me my mind into a little bit of a different mode, sort of had to really focus on you know what exactly is going on and try to figure it out you're trying to put the puzzle pieces together with along with anthony hopkins and i just thought that was such an interesting um aspect of the movie and nothing's called out either right like we at some point the kitchen that exists in this flat is sort of old and outdated and then at some point it's new and like modern whatever yeah and it's not said it's just like she walks into a different kitchen one day yeah and that's it um she wears the same like blue shirt most of the movie and then a couple of scenes she's wearing like a white shirt a couple of scenes she's wearing a yellow shirt and nothing is said about that but it's just like it exists and it's there and if you're ready for it you see it yeah th these are these are cues right from the director these are cues as to tell you where we are in time yeah um or where we are basically in um anthony's mind um, yeah because ostensibly the the movie takes place over the course of a day Mm -hmm. theoretically Ish, yeah like he wakes up um this new caretaker is coming in he's meeting her they have a conversation the like her and boyfriend comes back mm -hmm. they quarrel yep um he goes to bed and then the next day he wakes up and the caretaker comes back again yeah and that's sort of like the plot quote unquote as it were of the movie that's sort of what the plot is, right? Yeah. But all, all of that is like jumbled around. Yeah, and it's and it's disorienting. Yeah, when you watch it, um, you know, it, it, I don't know. It, it's just such a it's such a different movie than anything I, I think I've ever seen before. Um, it's just a totally different experience than um, than anything I've seen before. Like I said, but like, yeah, I don't know. It's just it's and it's gut wrenching, especially at the end. Um, and I think it's certainly frustrating throughout the you know first maybe one or two acts of the film but i think the reward at the end is like is what you came for you yeah know? and we should mention that the acting is is like terrific olivia coleman is amazing and so is anthony hopkins and i think that's part of the reason why this movie works like we mentioned before like the first and only choice to play this role was anthony hopkins and he's such a um, like amazing magnetic presence on screen that even though he doesn't really understand what's going on. You want to like be with him as he is. His brain is like working harder yeah. to put the pieces together. Yeah. And he's, and his character is not necessarily a nice character. He's, you know, kind of an asshole. He's very abrasive. He yeah. has his ways as uh, Olivia Coleman's character or, or Anne puts it. Um, so, you, you know, you have, you have a lot of sympathy for Anne, maybe not as much for, um, Anthony, um, but you can kind of understand why he's frustrated and why he's acting this way because he's confused as to what's going on. He's getting told one thing, uh, but he forgets and, and thinks another. Um, and I think I was going to ask you actually, who do you think the protagonist and antagonist of the movie is? Um, yeah, give it to me. Well, I, I think Anthony is the protagonist, and I think I actually think I want to get to this a little bit later, but mm -hmm. I, I think everything around him is his own creation in a way. Mm -hmm. I can explain that later, but I, okay. I think that he populates everything. I don't yes. know. I think the antagonist is probably like the disease, you know what I mean? But I think he is the person that um, has built everything and tears everything down. Right. And he's the one that can't quite understand why things are the way they are, but he's the one that is making them that way. Yeah. I was going to say the antagonist was probably the husband just because he was very unsympathetic to the disease 
And he's, you know, he slaps him in the face. I mean, he, yeah, that he was do that to an old man. That was weird. I wonder if that's if that really happened or what that was about. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know either. Um, the only other thing I wanted to mention was because this is our third play this season. Mm. Uh, I think we've talked a lot about the camera and what the camera can do in a filmed version of a play versus what it can do in the, you know, on stage version of the play. And we talked about in Ma Rainey, how the camera went outside and followed her like once or twice. Um, in one night in Miami, it, it really goes wherever it wants to go. Yeah. Like that is much more of a movie than it is a play uh, as it's filmed. And then in this story, the camera really doesn't go anywhere else. But what I think is cool is that it can, unlike a play, like if uh, in a play, when you end one act and start another act, the lights go down, you have to change the sets physically, then the lights can go back up. Mm -hmm. In a movie, he can turn around and his flat can be totally different. Right. There's this sort of like magic, disorienting, confusing skill that the camera has that can like in real time take away what you thought was a reality. Right. Which that, you know, on stage you can't quite do because there has to be a stoppage and a reset and then a restart. Yeah. I think the most noticeable ex example of what you just said was the kitchen where we get a scene where Anthony is coming home from um, buying groceries and he's unpacking and he's kind of having moments of like forgetting what he's doing and stuff, but it's an old style kitchen and then maybe it's the next scene or one of the very few next scenes where we're introduced to a brand new kitchen and it changes throughout, right? There's different angles as well that make you think, is this the same kitchen? Is it not? It's the same color, but like this looks different. Um, that's really used like in really interesting ways that in a play, you just kind of build your set for that um, act and then you change it for the next act, right? So you just have it for that, whatever that act, however long that is, but it seems to, ch it seems to change scene by scene but yeah yes and it's it's more seamless i think yeah which helps the dislocation build yeah i think yeah and i i wanted to ask i, I don't know if you know anything about like color color theory or anything like that but i wonder what the blue represented because there was a lot of blue in the apartment at certain points and she was wearing that blue dress throughout and she was always her character was always against sort of a blue background if you noticed, um, I don't know if blue represents something. Um, I don't know. That's a good question. Yeah, I don't know. It could be compositional or just, you know, the producers, the scene designers, production assistants, whatever. Yeah. It's coming up with something that neat. I don't know. That's a good question. Yeah. yeah so I, I don't know. Yeah. You want to ask there is, there is something in the movie about painting though, right? Like, yes. Um, his Anthony's daughter, Lucy. not Anne. Lucy, um, was a painter. Yep. And there's like, her paintings are all over the walls and you can sort of track what's happening with the number of paintings that are like on or off the walls. Right. Um, so, I mean, there certainly is something to like that visual element. Mm -hmm. Right. And it, it would make sense that it tracks like throughout the, the, like the, the visual story as well. Yeah. No, there's definitely something there, you know, We'll just need a color theorist to come on and explain it for yeah, us. Yeah, I can't help you with color theory. Yeah, all right. We'll move on. Um, I did want to mention how great the apartment was, though. The flat. Yeah. Pretty cool, right? Yeah. I would love to live there. Um, Hopefully without the, without it changing too much, but... Yeah, nice little London flat. Yeah, it'd be great. It sort of gave me, like, uh, Marvelous Miss Maisel vibes with these, like, you know, har big Harlem apartments from, like, pre-war. They're just massive and... Yeah. The layout is very strange. There's just doors and hallways everywhere. Nowadays, it's like you live in a closet for three thousand dollars a month in Manhattan. Yeah. So I wonder how much that apartment cost. Like, a, well, nowadays it that would be like if for rent, maybe like. Do you think they own it in London too? Maybe four thousand dollars a month. At, well, probably more, because it was a multi bedroom, right? Well, we don't know for sure. Yeah, I mean it's massive. It was massive. There's several rooms. Definitely yeah, I don't over know. a million. But. She seems to have. There's finances are not really a thing in this movie. I mean, yeah, they, so, you could tell he's loaded. So, yeah, yeah. Um, Eric, was this adaption loose, literal, or reimagined? I think this was totally literal. You probably agree with that, right? Yeah, for sure. Um, we can get into some of the the differences. There, there are not a lot. Right. Um, for me, the 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 most obvious one is that we changed the setting. So in the in the play, because it's a French play, it's set in Paris, um, 
and in this movie because the actors are british it's set in london right um and they sort of mirror each other like that i think at some point Anne tells anthony she's moving from london to paris in the play that's flipped she's moving from paris to london exactly um as a brit anthony in the movie drinks tea not coffee in the play as a frenchman he drinks coffee not tea right um so some of that stuff is mirrored and that's not a i don't think a big thematic shift it's just sort of like anthony hopkins is welsh we gotta put him in london yeah and it's it's funny the the joke that they had in the in the play was you know why would you move to london and it always rains there and then in the movie it's you know why would you move to paris they don't even speak english yeah so you lived in in uh england would you say there's more anti-french sentiment from the brits or more anti-brit sentiment from the french because i know that they like have there's like so, some sort of like a disdain for each other they definitely do um i didn't i've never lived in france so but there's definitely anti-french sentiment in england it's sort of like it's i wouldn't say it's like super like aggressive or it's more of like a joke you know what i mean but it's also like there's something to it. There's yeah. something deep down that's like I really do hate the French, but like I also just am making fun of them. But I also still hate them. Okay. But I'm also just making fun of them. I do just remember so we're clear. when we were wa- when we watched like Premier League in the morning and some of the announcers, because like some of the players would be French and they would just wouldn't pronounce their names. Yeah, oh, like yeah, the way yeah, yeah. that those names are pronounced. They say like they pronounce it like if it's like mallet, like M A L L E T, they would say mallet instead of in French. It's like Malay. Right. Yeah. So, so they do that on purpose. So it's so just like they subtle know, digs. Yeah, yeah. They know they're doing it, but um so that's that's like the first difference. I think mm-hmm. the other difference I would mention is there is a s maybe let's talk about let's talk about the the ending, right? Okay. Um so if you don't want spoilers, this might be a good time to to check out. Mm-hmm. Um because I, I think this it's hard to talk about without talking about like theory of what happened. Cause I think you can interpret what happens in this movie in a lot of different ways. Right. So it, it is left somewhat unsaid, somewhat unclear. Um, but what is clear is that Anthony is always looking for his other daughter and sister Lucy. Mm-hmm. Um, one of their, the, the newest caretaker, Laura reminds him of Lucy. Yep. And in the movie, she, looks the same as lucy right your girl emojin pots poots poots thank you um will's will's a new my future girlfriend yes we can just say it um so there's a scene there's a scene where anthony is confused he walks down the hallway in the flat and he throws open these two like wide doors and finds himself in a hospital wing um because he's hearing Lucy's voice, like call to him, like mm-hmm. father, father, where are you? Uh, he follows the voice, finds her laying in a bed, like badly hospital bed bruised, like on her deathbed, essentially. She, she's got like a neck brace on. Yeah. She might be on a ventilator too. Yeah. Um, and you can tell she's dying now in the play. It's very much hinted at that. She had an accident. Lucy did. And although he thinks she's going to visit him, she never will because we assume that she died. Yeah. And I think you can make the assumption that it, she probably got in a drunk driving accident of some kind. Oh, okay. Um, they talk about it. Like when they're having whiskey, when he's having whiskey with Laura, he makes a reference to her not drinking and never drinking. Cause she's yeah, always she's being sober. So, Your mother so was sober. sober. Yeah. Um, so I, I think you could, you can make the read pretty easily that like these people are sober because uh, Lucy who had an accident. Interesting. Cause they're like, they're paired together, I think. Yeah. So, um, I hadn't, I hadn't made that connection, but I think, I think you're probably right with that. Yeah. Like that. And in the film, they just like very literally show us her dying on a ventilator. Yeah. Um, which is totally not shown in the, in the play. No, it's not. Um, and I think, you know, given the film, you're allowed to sort of go there, right? The camera, or you're allowed to take there in a play, you have to build a whole new set, right? You have to build sort of a hospital ward with a new bed. So it's probably more difficult to do that in a play. Um, but given the film, you're allowed to, you know, build these things and go there with more money and whatever, et cetera. Um, but you know, did you like it? Did you like that addition? Yeah. I think it's, it was interesting because as you say, like you'd have to build something else like physically set wise. 
but in this he just sort of like continues down a hallway like he's going down a hallway throws open the doors continues down the hallway and he just happens to be in a hospital right so it is a sort of a continuation like okay where the fuck is he um but to show her i think it gives us a sense that he can or he is capable of like memories Mm. um and i think as we're going to talk about in a moment his progression as a character sort of inches him back in time and so i think it makes sense as a marker of his regression that he would go back to the point in time when his youngest daughter died right um so we should also mention i'm not sure if we mentioned it before but he is constantly referring to her as she never visits me you know when whenever she's gonna come visit we're gonna have such a great time and she's my favorite daughter and all these things she's the painter she's the painter and in yeah. Basically, it's referred to from the other character's behavior that she is no longer with us. She's passed away and stuff. But he is not aware of it. Or he, has, he doesn't remember this. But towards the end of the film, he's reminded this memory sort of resurfaces. Yeah. I think Laura, at one point, his caretaker is like, I'm so sad. I'm so sorry to hear about your daughter. Like, I heard about the accident. And he's like, what accident? Right. And he just moves right past that. Right. Um, but yeah, I, I think it's really the only memory that we're shown like real tangible memory. Everything else is sort of him saying so and, right. and reacting. But mm-hmm. this is a very big departure from just like he said, she said, he remembered, she remembered yeah. thing. Um, and I don't, I don't, it's, it is, I don't know. It, it's somewhat hard to parse because on the one hand, like that's a very purposeful show, right? Are you saying that his youngest daughter dying sort of set him on a path to like memory loss? Mm. Is it is it like grief that set him up to mm. have this Maybe. sort of like a, emotional memory breakdown? I don't know. That's possible, I suppose. Um, on the other hand, I, I do think it's important as just like this memory mechanism to show like the regression to put him, because we don't know when she died. She was young and, and is middle-aged. So right. if they were somewhat similar in age, could have been, been 20, 30 years in the past yeah. where she died. So right. um, it's interesting. It's up for interpretation, like the, a lot of this movie is. Yeah, I mean, you, you, it certainly leaves it open to, for us to fill in the cracks. Um, and it's possible that this sort of triggered that, that traumatic event, since they were so close, according to him, would trigger something like this. Um, of course, as well as him being much older, right? He's, in, he's probably in his close to around 90 years old or something. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, you can certainly infer that, you know, that was m- maybe one of the causes of, of, of his memory decline and, and et cetera. But I think it probably also shows the power too of the flat. Like he can just go wherever he wants. The flat contains a lot of things, mm-hmm. whether it's the past or whatever. Right. That he can visit yeah. when he wants to. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that was, that was certainly a very powerful, powerful scene. It was certainly added a lot to the movie. Um, but let's talk about the monologue. Yeah, that was not in the film, and this so, is a bit minor, but yeah. So the the thing with these two is that they are, I mean, they're very literal, right? There's there's very little that is different, mm-hmm. very right. little. Like even on a sentence level, yeah. I mean, it's very very similar. Yeah, um, there is one moment where this is the same Laura scene. He's sort of showing off to her. He's being a little flirty, a little bit of a cad. Yeah, um, and he mentions that he used to do card tricks yeah like back in the day to show off to his wife and he was like sort of a good magician he was able to like hide things pretty well and that got cut out of the movie and for something that was so literally adapted i just thought that was kind of interesting yeah well you'll have to remind me of what he says in the monologue because i don't specifically remember or like what he's talking about because he only briefly mentions in the movie about uh you know i you know i was a magician i used to be in carnivals yeah Uh, back in the day yeah so he said i worked in the circus for a bit when i was young i was quite talented especially at conjuring tricks would you like me to show you a little magic i need a pack of cards right um and then he basically says before i was married i used to play cards with friends sometimes till the you know the early morning Mm -hmm. place your bets i'm going to show you a trick you've never seen a magic trick i'm going to blindfold you and you'll whatever yeah so he only briefly mentions in the movie uh whereas in the book he has a full monologue but and i guess maybe that was already covered Right. And in the fact that he was talking about him tap dancing and being a great tap dancer. And then Anne is like, no, you were an engineer. And he says, what do you know about it? So I guess 
maybe removing that from the film is sort of like it get, it frees up space for a scene where they can show her in the deathbed yeah seeing the deathbed right because it's sort of like repetitive we've already kind of covered this he has false memories about him being a tap dancer or a magician whatever maybe not false but maybe not exactly true either yeah it is the the trick card trickness of it is what caught me because there is a moment where paul um pierre in the play pierre is like sometimes i think you're faking all this and when i saw the card trick i was like oh okay so he's a bit of a magician Mm -hmm. he's a bit of like a performer someone who can change reality Mm -hmm. so maybe it's just a bit of characterization where he can change reality and maybe he is doing it on purpose that's interesting Uh, but by cutting it maybe you you don't leave room for that interpretation as much yeah i mean they refer to it but it's not sure they sort of don't they certainly don't give it the same legs as it does in the in the play yeah for that interpretation to be made yeah so like i in the movie you definitely think he's sick yeah right yeah he's ill he's ill yes he needs to go to an institution yeah um so eric the big question what do you think is happening yeah so i wanted to talk through this because i think it is left unclear i don't think you exactly know what happens at all during the course of this movie but i have an idea oh and i'm gonna run it by you okay and you can let me know what you think about it okay so the way i understand this movie and the play because i think they're pretty much doing the same thing is that what is true is the very beginning and the very end in the very beginning Anne comes to him and tells him i've met somebody i'm moving to paris or london I have your choice which which version you're using reading um, or watching i met someone i'm moving to london i need to put you in a home mm-hmm. and at the very end we learn that he has been in a home for some time mm-hmm. um and Anne's visited him a few times from paris or london or right. wherever she is um which means what happened in the middle yeah because there's a whole other 85 minutes between her telling him she's moving and him realizing he's been in a, or us realizing that he's been in a home for a long, a long while. time yeah so m- my thought is that he goes to the home at the very very beginning Like after she has a conversation. Yeah. So she comes to tell him, I'm moving to Paris, let's say. I'm putting you in a home now. Right. And that happens immediately. Mm -hmm. But the home is shaped in a way that reminds him of his own flat or Anne's flat. Mm -hmm. And he just populates the nursing home with his unclear memories of what took place in like the final weeks, months, years Mm -hmm. before he like fully succumbs to his disease. Um, Because there are moments where he talks to Anne and Anne is married currently. Mm -hmm. There are moments where he talks to Anne and Anne's been divorced for 10 years, for five years. And then there's moments where Anne is actively dating the Parisian guy or whatever. So how can that all be true? It can't. And there are moments also where Anne is played by who we subsequently learn is the nurse at the nursing home. Yes. So for me, I sort of think that in Anthony's mind, he has, he sees the nurse and he thinks sometimes that she's Anne. Right. Or he sees the male nurse and he thinks sometimes that's Paul. Right. The husband. Yeah. And he play acts in his mind and married to her ex, Mm -hmm. who I think was also named Anthony in the book. Mm -hmm. And I can't remember his name in the movie. Or, you know... James. James in the movie. Yeah, so he'll, he play acts that Anne is actively married or that Anne is divorced and this is the boyfriend. Mm. And he just continues to move backwards in his memories um, until at the very end, he like literally forgets who he is. Yeah. He cries like a like a baby. Yeah. Um, calls in, for his mommy. Calls for his mommy. Like, it's to... And like, he's totally, like, who am I? Totally breaks down. He literally doesn't know who he is. So... For me, it's just like him turning from Anthony, the person. And we talked about this a little bit last night after we watched the movie. Like in my experience with Alzheimer's, your memories just sort of like wipe away until they get down to their earliest Mm. 
like until you get down to your earliest moments. Right. Like you're calling out for somebody that you knew at one, two or three years old. Yeah. Which is incredible. Yeah. For someone who's 90 to remember all that. So for me, he's just, everything has been wiped away until there is nothing left to wipe away. But in doing so, he's play acting scenes from his past Mm -hmm. using the nurse characters as ciphers for Anne or for Paul or for James or what have you. Mm Mm-hmm. So that's my thought. No, I think I actually think you are, you know, as close to being right as you can be in this movie. I think that is sort of how the director wants you to interpret it because I mean that makes total sense, right? You know, we the first scene she tells him I'm moving to Paris, blah blah blah, um, and the next scene she says, "What are you talking about? Like I'm, I'm not moving to Paris, blah blah blah, whatever." So we're immediately thrown into this disillusion. So I think you're right. I think that is true, right? That is that actually happened. And then the next scene, he basically moves into the the home. And we're told at the end that he's been there for several weeks and that she's moved uh, to Paris for several months and she comes to visit when she can. He comes to visit when she can. And I think Angela, who was the previous carer for Anthony, was not part of the, of the film, not part of the current story, but that is what triggered them to sort of put her in a home yeah. put, excuse me put anthony in a home and that his interaction with the lucy double right uh laura laura um that is actually just the new care at the new home and then so he's sort of experiencing that um transition into the home by not really believing that he's in the home he still believes that he's in the flat um but that is introduced um with, uh, through Laura, essentially, like that—that's—that's that's how I believe that that transition happened. Well, if you remember, Laura is also played by the nurse, right? And Anne's played by the nurse also. And I don't think you could, like, Anne couldn't be played by the nurse unless he was in the home, exactly, because that woman wouldn't exist in his mind, exactly. And so, as well, the the other nurse, the man, is he also plays the ex husband yep. of Anne. So and her boyfriend too, right? Because I think at some point. Uh, yeah, I think you're right. But we're introduced to those characters early on as well. Yeah. Right? So I think you're totally right. I think they he basically moved into the the home or the institution, whatever you want to call it, um, after that first scene. And then that was, he, his memories, like he, like you said, he was play acting. He yeah. was not really believing that he was in a home and et cetera. And I do, I th- at some point, Anne comes to visit. I think we're told that at the end. And it, obviously there are some points in the m- movie where, and is played by Olivia Coleman and then not, and then played by Olivia Coleman again. So to me, it's like the, the second Olivia Coleman is in there, mm-hmm. she's probably visiting him in the home. Yeah. And so that's why he sees her again. Right. Because she's actually there. Right. And when she's not there, he can't quite see her all the time. Yeah. Yeah. And he's having these old flashbacks of, of memories about her bringing chicken to the home and cooking chicken and then getting slapped by her, probably her ex-husband, right? Yeah, maybe that's why um, they broke up. Because they seem to be having tension about him moving into the flat, and he was very uncomfortable with that, and he wanted him to basically be put in a home. Um, so, yeah, maybe, that, yeah, that's my thought. Because no, I, I think you're right. I, I I think it is up to interpretation. Mm-hmm. Um, because it is is left unclear. Yeah, it's certainly not spelled out, and I think with multiple viewings, I think you will be sort of proven correct. We should probably watch it again and again and again. Yeah. Not right now. Now that we have a a SAG screener, we can do it. Yeah. Oh my God. Thank God. Shout out to whoever gave us that. Appreciate it. Um, So was this adaptation successful? I think it was a big success. I thought this movie was wonderful. I thought it was great. Hopefully more people can see it over time. Um, Currently, I don't think it, I think you probably have to buy it online if it's available online at all. Yes, it is available online to rent slash buy. I mean, renting it is like 20, I think it's about like $20 or something. So you might as well just buy it for a couple extra bucks. Um, but definitely recommend seeing it. Probably movie theaters are opening again. Yeah, but, you know, be careful. Or uh, join SAG and get a... Uh, <laughs> Become an actor. Yeah, and, get, uh, yeah. get screeners. <laughs> Become an actor. <laughs> eschew your uh, goals for money. And, That's the easiest way to do it, I think. Yeah, yeah. So... And get your, um, yeah, award screeners. Yeah, so hopefully we'll see how it does in a couple weeks' time at the Oscars. But which I think you know, I think it has a decent chance to get some awards. Although it's not, uh, not the front runner. It's, it's not, not the front runner. Or anything. And I don't think a lot of people have really seen it. 
um, given its subject subject nature and as well as not availability. being average, yeah, availability. The best average, ability so. will is availability. Is that right? So I never heard. If that you before. can't watch the movie. It's not going to win any awards. <laughs> Eric, give me your hot take. Uh, my hot take is that Anthony Hopkins is the goat. He's so good. Yeah. Um, I think in an, in probably in another year he could have won this Best Actor Oscar because um, he, obviously he's going up against Chadwick Boseman and from Ma Rainey and that's probably too high a hill to climb for him. Yeah. Um, but like we mentioned before, six Oscar nominations ties him with a bunch of people. Like I think I said, twenty sixth all time. Mm-hmm. There's a bunch of people with a ton of nominations. Meryl Streep, twenty one all time. Yeah. God Crazy. Almighty. God Almighty. That, that's a that's a lot. Yeah. Um, but he's amazing in this movie, yeah. and he works all the time. Yeah. Like he's always in movies, and he's always good. And even when he's in Marvel movies, or even in like schlocky horror movies, he's good. Yeah. Um. Obviously, Science of the Lambs was huge for him too. Mm-hmm. But like, he's just always good. Yeah, he was in uh, the Pope, the Two Popes, or something. Yeah, from yeah. last year. Shout so, out Netflix. Yeah. That was that was a good movie. I never saw that, but I heard it's good. Yeah, yeah. Well, there's two popes, and at some point, there is only going to be one pope. So. Oh really? So that's a spoiler alert. Damn. There's only ever one pope at a time. Well, now I don't have to watch it. So there you go. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah. My hot take is very similar. It's Anthony Hopkins is underrated. Um, although you just claimed that he was a goat, so maybe he's overrated. Now that maybe he is now. You said that. <laughs> I just think he doesn't. He's not. Um, he probably doesn't get the credit he deserves. I mean, certainly he's been nominated six times, but I feel like in greatest actors of all time conversation, he's not really in that conversation uh, all as much as he probably should be. Um, he's in a bit of a late career run. Yeah, you for know, sure. like he finally found the roles that he needs to be playing. Yeah, like he's aged into whatever whatever is like hot for him to do yeah i mean it's certainly worked out for him in the past five five ten years or so but um yeah i mean he you're, like you said he was great and so was olivia coleman like i, I think i mentioned and while we were watching like she's just fucking great in this movie like just her facial expressions and the way that she communicates herself is just like spectacular and it's just on point she's another one on a on a run like ever yeah. since she got on the crown I think she's had like three Oscar nominations, like back to back to back. Yeah, she won for the favorite. Yeah. I think she might have been nominated for something else. Yeah. Um, but now she's nominated again. So. I think she's probably won a, a couple of Emmys or Golden Globes. She's probably close to an EGOT now. She, I think she, because she used to be a, a TV actor, so I think she has won an Emmy. She's probably well, won. I, a, I think she won for The Crown, at least. Oh, you're probably, yeah, you're right. I don't watch The Crown, so I'm not super yeah. familiar with it, but. But she's she's another one on a, like, on a heater. Yeah. So this movie's hot, baby. So check yeah. it out um we don't watch movies because they're of their ron tomato score we watch them because of their temperature exactly and this movie is hot (laughs) i like that eric movie or play uh no surprise movie i think it it just um took what was good about the play and made it even better yeah totally agree um it wasn't really close even though the play was was very enjoyable to read i think the movie is just like just took it to a whole nother level yeah i think the thing with the play is that it's it's you're not able to imagine it imagine it in a way you would with a novel Mm -hmm. because there's less scene setting there's less just description in general Mm -hmm. so it's really just words on a page right um which is it's a hard place to start from yeah to to beat the movie yeah i I think it's it's tough yeah um so final thoughts what will you remember from the play i think the setup most of all um just you know how all the acts were slightly out of order and how that ended up working yeah i've never you know you don't see this very often no right? definitely not um even like yeah you just don't see it very often and i thought it worked really well i i will remember being confused because i was like what the hell is going on and then eventually i was not confused anymore but you came out of it I came out of a thing. I came yeah. out of my stupor. And then the movie, what are you going to remember? Uh, performances, I think. Um, but beyond those, also the humor. I think there are points in this movie where it's okay to laugh. Yes. Um, and I think, which is important because for as like dark as this is, there are moments of like humanity that can shine through from, from people who have Alzheimer's. And so um, putting those on screen, I think, is both truthful and helps the audience like interact with your, with your work. Right. Yeah. If it was just all 
deep dark sadness that wouldn't be as engaging as a movie about a person like this is this is more of a movie about a person right the ups and the downs yeah. like there are good days there are bad days right there are good like pockets of memory and, and bad ones but you gotta forget the bad ones just the good ones yeah but I, I think letting the light in was was good definitely um and then for me the end scene where he officially breaks we you know we realize he's in a home and he officially breaks down um and is crying out to his mom it's just like i know it sounds ridiculous saying out loud but it's such a powerful scene um to end the film and i think it's you know a subject that you know most people have probably interacted with and i think you mentioned that you know that is something that you have experienced like firsthand that exact uh where he breaks down to the point where he's like a, a child basically yeah and that is maybe a recurring symptom of alzheimer's and dementia um it's just powerful it's just a, such a powerful scene and then after that you sort of see you know, he mentions he's losing his leaves and then you see kind of a zoom in on trees. Yeah. Trees and leaves blowing in the wind. So I just thought that was a, a great way to end the film. Um, just very powerful. Yeah. So, and then I actually wanted to mention a scene where he's looking outside of his window. Um, and he's watching a kid playing with like a bag. Oh yeah. And for whatever reason, I think like, what is the, I want to ask you, like, what was the intention of that scene? Like, why was he showing the scene? Like, he's losing his bag. He's losing something. He's losing his mind. Like, is there something in there that I... I feel like there's something there. And I'm just not... Putting it together fully. Yeah. Yeah, I don't... That's a good question. I think in the... What I read before the episode started, it mentions, like, the leaves falling off the trees, but also, like, the wind... Yeah, just like rustling through his the branches of his mind. Yes. So maybe there's something with wind and how it like both can blow things down, but then also like move things around in a way that will like jog memories or jog mm-hmm. happiness or something. I don't know. That, yeah, yeah. I didn't thought about. That. I forgot about that. I just remember little... watching. I was like, "What is this trying? What is this scene trying to say?" And I just I wanted to bring it up, and I just remembered it now. Yeah. So plastic shout out, shout bags to, blowing in the wind. Shout out to my memory through a hurricane. Yeah. All right, so we're going to sign off here. Um, That is it for us today. Check out our most recent episode on News of the World. And keep an eye out for our next episode, which is an interview with Lane Schefter Bishop, CEO of Vast Entertainment, which is a production company focused solely on bringing books to life on the screen. So that is coming up uh, within the next week or so. And that will actually round out our season on 2021 Oscar bait, which was fun. It was fun. Yeah. And the Oscars are coming up in a couple of weeks here too. So we'll see... uh... Hopefully one of the episodes we did will be a winner. Yeah, yeah. we'll see. We um, we'll see if we can do a recap. Hopefully Borat Two doesn't win. Two, that would be ridiculous. So we'll see. Anyways, any shout outs? Um, no shout out. Well, I'll shout out Lady in Chapter Bishop. We've been teasing her episode for a while. Um, excited to have everyone hear it in a couple of weeks. Yeah, it's a very good conversation. I would like to shout out your neighbor who did not sweep up the leaves uh, on the sidewalk. I think that this is made me slip and fall and embarrass myself this is a recurring thing i think on this podcast now which is like neighbors not either shoveling their drive or uh sidewalks or not sweeping their sidewalks i mean it's ridiculous yeah i know what you're talking about i've almost those it's like a magnolia tree shed its leaves and it rained really hard yesterday and so now they're just like mush pile yeah just a mush pile and it is it's like a banana peel it, I is, mean, it is it's like legit slippery. i'm literally gonna hurt myself one of these times yeah walking to your house yeah but let we'll me know, then we'll sue them and uh, yeah. we'll take their house from them. Oh, perfect. And then can I get the money here? You'll okay. get the house. I'll oh, get the I'll house. I'll have the house. Oh, good. Sick. All right, cool. All right, well, thank you very much. We'll see you guys next time.